Hey, good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. I am so glad that the faithful few made it on the one Sunday between Christmas and New Year's while so many are traveling. You might, there are lots of people that probably are not here this morning, but thank you for being here and being a part of this Sunday. It's going to be special. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be a good time. If you have a Bible or a device or something with you and you want to follow along because slacker me, I didn't get anything for the beautiful screen. It's probably going to stay dark the whole time I'm up here. So if you have a Bible or a device or something like that, we are going to be camping out this morning in Daniel chapter 3. We're going to be talking about some pretty cool things this morning, but before we get going, I need to set a foundation, set a little bit of ground rules for what we're going to be doing this morning and how you can best follow along in what we're going through because it's going to be rapid paced. It's going to be going very quick. So, Anybody ever flown into Vegas? Anybody show of hands? Anybody ever flown into Vegas? I've been to Vegas one time. Uh, it was two years ago, and I'm actually going to be going again in May and June for a conference for work. But go. So we're going to be going on a flight to Vegas. It's going to be similar to that. When you take off, there's this thrill and rush. You're like kind of worried. You're nervous about it because like the plane takes off and all of a sudden you realize you just went faster than any Tesla ever dreamed of going. Zero to 60 in like 0.1 seconds and the G-forces, you feel them. You're nervous. The plane takes off. It settles down. You're like, cool. We're going. We've reached cruising altitude. We've got turbulence. And like you're flying and there's turbulence in the air and everything gets kind of wild and shaky and you're like, I don't know if I really want to be here. This is kind of bothering me. And then the plane, you know, settles down a little bit and you cruise and then you're coming into Vegas and you think everything is good to go. And as you're coming down to land, Vegas is in an area where the wind kind of just is gone. And there is so much turbulence when you land in Vegas. Anybody that's ever flown into Vegas, you know. It's nothing compared to the turbulence that felt in the air. So you're coming down and you're like, oh my God, we're going to die, everybody. Like, you think the plane's going to shake apart. And then something crazy happens. The rubber meets the meets the runway, you touch down, and you have safely arrived at your destination, and you realize your vacation is about to start. And you're excited, and that is the journey that we're gonna go on. It's gonna be very quick. I'm not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be a four-hour deal. Um, I got it down to 30 minutes and nine seconds last night, but <laughs> I don't know about that. We're gonna try. We are going to try. So, with that in mind, knowing that we're gonna go through some turbulence, we're gonna go through some fast-paced portions, if you would, please just, this is so important. This is so important. I've thought about this and prayed about this. This idea that we're gonna go through this morning is something I've had on my heart for probably two years. And it's something that I really just, I find it to be so important for us, especially, especially, us men who like to fix things, especially us men who like to fix things. So what is it that we place our trust in? Speaking of that, I'm going to pray right before we jump in to that because our trust needs to be in the Lord. So let's pray. God, thank you for this morning, the opportunity to be here with your people, to speak your word, and to share from my heart what I believe that you have given me to speak this morning. I ask that you would be with the people that are here, soften our hearts to be receptive to that word. Open our minds to be receptive to that word. You're awesome, we love you, and we place our trust, our faith, and our hope in you and you alone. Amen. What do we place our trust in? What is it that we run to when times get hard? What do we glory in when times are good? I like to think that my trust is in 
the Lord, that I run to him and him alone when things are tough, that I glory in and celebrate with him when things are going well. But far too often, I find myself wanting my plans to work out just like I want them to. Now, yesterday, we went to um, Alabama to visit Lindsay's grandparents. And my, this reminds me much of my dear, sweet three-year-old. He's a fantastic human being. He's little, he has a giant heart, and he wants things his way when he wants them. So anything, he hasn't quite grasped this idea that mommy, daddy, um, pops, uh, granddaddy, CC, Mimi, any of the family ha- that has been there and done that or knows how things work, he hasn't quite grasped that we might be able to teach him how to do it the right way the first time and then he can enjoy it even longer. He can have a, a better time playing with that toy if he just let us show him how it works the first time. But no, he's three. He wants to do it his way. And if he doesn't get to do it his way when he wants to, he pitches a royal fit. Um, I would venture to say that that doesn't just describe my three-year-old. I think that probably describes most of us in this room, though. I, I know it describes me personally. Um, I, I find myself placing my faith, my hope, and my trust in something other than the Lord. I place my faith and my hope and my trust off, oftentimes in my own logic. I'm, I'm, I think, like to think of myself as a thinker and I have a technical job and I think really well in pressure situations. And so I place my own faith, hope, and trust in my own logical ability Sometimes I think that my way is the only way. I think that the logical choice is the only right way because, and I know we've all heard this before, the Lord gave me a brain so I should use it. Everybody heard that? I know I've heard the Lord gave me a brain. He gave me a mind so I should use it. It's common grace that the Lord gave me a brain. I should use it. And yes, that's absolutely true. The Lord did give you a brain. You should use it. You should think through situations. But thinking back, I can tell you several times where I personally let my own thoughts on how something should work out or what made sense cloud my judgment about the direction that I chose to go in. It makes total sense to go in this direction. But I feel like the Lord might be pushing me to go in this direction. And it's counterintuitive to what I think. It's counterintuitive to how I feel I should go because I'm the leader of my family, right? No, I'm I'm not. That's a good thing. But I should be the one leading. I should be the one driving the direction, helping us go. But, But sometimes the Lord pushes me in a different way. And far too often, I believe that maybe I've chosen the route of security over over obedience to the Lord. You know, we've even heard it here in sermons. I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, that in 2008 or 2009, we went through a series, those of you that have been here that long probably remember it because it was fantastic. We went through a sermon series called Guardrails. And Frank did a fantastic job of unpacking that as kind of a spinoff of something that Andy Stanley had done. And guardrails are this idea that we're on a road and that we set up guardrails to keep us on the path so that when we get close, we don't go off the cliff, but that we keep our path and that we don't submit to things that are not on our path. One of the questions that I remember from that sermon series was this. When you're in a situation, you ask yourself this question, what story do you want to tell? When it's all over, when you're, in the, when you're in a situation, you ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? What story do I want others to tell about me? I think it's a fantastic question from a pragmatic standpoint. And I mean, seriously, if you think about your future and remember that one day everything you do will just be a story that you tell 
or it will be a story that is told about you, who would choose the option where you're made out to be the moron? Nobody would. No one would choose that. You would choose the story. You would choose a different story. We all want things to be said about us when we're gone that are good. We all want to be able to tell stories where we end up being the hero. We want to tell stories where we place ourselves on a pedestal. That's why every single one of the stories that my dad has told about his fishing include very large fish. <laughs> they include very large fish and they always, or maybe it's not the biggest fish, but it always includes his stringer had more fish on it than mine did. Every story. And I, I have to admit, normally that was true. I think maybe twice I came out on the other end of that. I know in my own life that I have always embellished stories so that it painted me in a better light. On a side note though, this is, this is on a side note, the, this is actually one of the evidences that we have. Um, th this is one of the evidences that we have that the Bible itself is trustworthy. So if you think about Peter, Peter wrote to first and second Peter and he was written about a lot and he knew the guys that wrote the New Testament. He interacted with Paul and several of the guys that wrote throughout the New Testament. And and Paul or and Peter had the opportunity to talk with some of the writers of the gospels. He said, and I, I could think like I can imagine Peter saying this to them, dude, can you please leave out that part? That, that part, you remember that one part that you wrote in there where in, when Jesus was in his time of need that I denied him three times? Can you just kind of leave that out? Don't put, don't put that in there. I don't want people to think that Peter, me, I'm the rock, see the guy that the church is gonna be built. I don't want people to think that I denied Christ three times. Can you leave that out? Or maybe, hey, when you're writing that part about that really cool part where Jesus was walking to us on a storm and those other 11 guys were all scared and cowering back there and I was like, who is it, Jesus? And he said, come to me. He said, come to me on the water. And so I stepped out onto the boat, you know, and I got onto the water. And can you rewrite that a little bit to talk about how nimble I was and maybe cat-like out there and I, you know, did a little jig on the water and then I got out there, you know, and leave the part out where I began to sink, where I became scared, where I took my eyes off of Jesus. Can you leave that out? Because I want to be a hero. I want to be the person in the story that is made much of. But Peter didn't do that. He wrote some and he didn't remove the pieces where he was made to seem like a fool. This is evidence that we can trust the Bible. And there are so many more, but that's not what this is about. That's not what today is for. So getting back to today's idea, I can be the worst when it comes to thinking that I'm in line with God on things. But in hindsight, I know that I have simply been white knuckling a situation. I feel like I'm in control. You know, I desire to be in control. And, and when I'm doing that, I am so far from the life that God has planned for me from the beginning. All of us can fall into this boat. Without raising your hand, how many people in the room are control freaks? Definitely don't answer this one. How many people are sitting next to the control freak in your family? <laughs> how many people in here would go nuts if things didn't turn out just the way that you want them to? How many of you really go to the Lord for direction in all things? Are there some things that the Lord just doesn't need to be sought about? Like, for instance, vanilla or chocolate ice cream. There's an obvious answer, and we don't even need to seek the Lord for an answer to that. Vanilla or chocolate ice cream. Going to him for counsel and consultation is absolutely unnecessary. Do, th do this. Look to your neighbor. Look, look to your neighbor and tell them vanilla or chocolate, your preference, and do it all at the same time. Ready, set, go. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Seriously though, I mean really the answer clearly is strawberry. So <laughs> nobody, <laughs> I'll pray for everybody that didn't, didn't get that one right. I'll add you to my prayer list, but get, hear, hear me, hear me. This, this is so important. A lot of us here today, if we took an inventory of our prayer life, if we even have a prayer life, we would find that we are very self-centered and self-serving in our prayers. When we have trouble in life, this is the only time that we seriously approach the throne of God. We come to him and ask for a miracle for our loved ones. We come to him asking for that promotion at work. We come to him for all kinds of reasons. Uh, um, we, we come to him asking that our marriages would survive that one mistake that we made. All kinds of reasons. And then when something does work out, when things go our way, we can be so quick to give credit to the doctors. We can be so quick to give credit to our own hard work. We can be so quick to give credit to that self-help book. And yet we are slow to give credit to our Heavenly Father who made it all possible to begin with. We like to put our trust in ourselves because we live in a false world where we believe that we are in control. We're not in control. You're not in control, sir. You're not in control, ma'am. Student in this room, you're not in control. And pastor, you're not in control either. I know it might seem like you're in control and that you know just what to do in every circumstance that you're in. But the truth is that your sense of control is a lie that the enemy has allowed you to believe. You're not in control and we would all do well to realize that God is in control. <clears throat> now I know this feels heavy, but you've got to stay with me. This is our mid-flight turbulence. Um, for the journey that we're on this morning. So let's, let's keep going. Let's push forward through this tense time and get to the other side. Daniel chapter three. We're gonna see the heart of three young men who, and what it looked like to believe with their entire being that God was in control. Chapter three begins by telling us a bit about what King Nebuchadnezzar thought about himself. He was full of himself. He was a narcissist to the nth degree. He had an image of gold made that was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. Uh, that's 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. That's really big. Uh, statues are kind of like, if you go to, go to Bryant-Denny Stadium, the statue of Nick Saban, Roll Tide, is only like, it's only like 12 feet tall. This is 90 feet tall. It's huge. It's massive. It can be seen from very, very far away. The thought, of, thought is that this image was of the king himself, and he passed a decree that whenever the music played, everyone that could hear it would bow down and worship this image of gold. And anyone who did not do this would be cast into the fiery furnace and burned to death. Now, there were some certain Chaldeans. Chaldea is just an area inside of Babylon that was ruled by the Babylonians. Um, so it's just an area. It's like Georgia in the United States. It's just an area. There were some Chaldeans um, who refused to bow when the music was played because they feared the most high God, not King Nebuchadnezzar. And so when they, when they chose to not bow, they were brought before the king. And he was angry, but he was going to give them another chance. He was going to play some music and give them the opportunity to bow down and worship this image made of gold. But <clears throat> this, is, this is crazy. Before the king 
even had the chance to play the music. We see this in verse 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. This is, but this next part is so good. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. What incredible faith. What incredible thought to have to, to know that God is in control. These three men knew exactly who their trust was in. They knew exactly where their hope came from. They knew exactly who their faith was placed on. What an unbelievable statement. Let me, let me flesh this out a little bit to get it a little more because none of us are like being threatened to thrown it, be thrown into a fiery furnace or anything like that. We're probably not, uh, real, probably really not being persecuted for our faith today. <clears throat> so let me flesh it out a bit like this. My mom uh, was recently diagnosed with cancer and my, if my first, if I was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and I had their faith, my very first response would be this. God is going to take care of it, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to praise him. Maybe you've just made a mess of your marriage, but your first response would be that God is going to take care of it, but even if he doesn't, he is worthy of praise. Or maybe you just got laid off and the bank is threatening to foreclose on your house. Your very, your very first response to God is this. God is going to take care of it, but even if he doesn't, it will all be good because I know that his plan is better. <laughs> For most of us, it really plays out like this. We don't have that response. Our response is, oh no, what am I gonna do? How can I, oh, I'll, immediately our first thought is, what do I need to do? What do I need to fix in my work schedule so I can be there to help take care of my mom? What, what do I need to do? How, what self-help book do I need to read? What, what do I need to be involved in to fix my marriage? What do, what? Do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And our faith, our hope, and our trust in the initial response is on us. We place our trust in us. Far too often, we place our trust in us. You see, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if mom dies, my marriage ends, the house is gone, there's no food on the table, the kids are hungry, and yet still I can say, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. It sounds a lot like the book of Job. I don't have time to dig into everything about that, but he lost everything and yet he still prays, praised the Lord. What amazing faith, trust, and hope. The key here is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's very first response was that God's gonna take care of it and even if he doesn't, he's worthy of praise. They don't even give the king a chance to play their music. Bro, we don't even need to answer you because our God's amazing. We don't have to answer your question because God's gonna save us. And even if he doesn't, he's still better than you. I want faith like that. I want faith to know that I don't have to be in control because I know that God is. <clears throat> I've had a couple of things spoken to me over the last few years that I try to run through my head on a daily basis. These help me get my mind in the right place for starting the day, the week, the month, or even the year. And perhaps these will run through your head when you wake up on January 1st in just a couple of days. And I hope that they help you because they have definitely helped me. God's motivation for loving you is him. 
Psalm 23 says that he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isaiah 43, God created us. Why? For his glory. Isaiah 49, God called Israel for his glory. Psalm 106, God rescued Israel from Egypt for his glory. Romans 9, God raised up Pharaoh in order to glorify his name. Matthew and Peter, 1 Peter, do good works. Why? For the glory of God, not you. For the glory of God. John 14, Jesus says he answers prayers. Why? So that God would be glorified. God's motivation for loving you is him. Our motivation for loving God is him. Romans 1, worshiped, they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Essentially, this means that when we end up trading our love of God in for the things that God lets us enjoy, we trade in our trust and our love for God for the things that he's given us. We don't worship God, we worship the stuff that he's given us. But I remember that my motivation for loving God isn't me, it's not the things. My motivation for loving God is God. Our motivation for loving others, you guessed it, it's God. Our motivation for loving others isn't because they're in plight. Our motivation for loving others isn't because they're hungry, though those are good things. Our motivation for taking care of the poor, taking care of the oppressed, or moving forward to be good people isn't to take, isn't really to take care of others. It's not other people. It's not, it's not being in their plight or going through a situation with them. The motivation that we have for loving others is God. God is our motivation. 1 John chapter 4 says, let us love one another for love is from God. And it goes on to say, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Our motivation for loving others is God. Ultimately, life is about him. Colossians 1 says that all things are created through him and for him. So perhaps you can take some of these nuggets and remind, be reminded that, of God throughout this next year. And speaking of this next year, as we, as we go into the next year, we all need to spend time checking our hearts. We need to spend time in the Bible. We need to spend time and pray. And most of all, we need to grow close with Jesus Christ. My big challenge for me this morning, along with all of you, is that we would take a moment and examine our faith. Try to remember when it was good. Try to remember when you had really strong faith. Was it this last week during Christmas? What, was this last week during Christmas because of the Christmas Eve services and all the great services that Ben gave us to lead up to the Christmas story? Is that when your faith was really bubbling up? Was it a really good time in your life that you were going through and you felt like you were on point with God? Or was it right after maybe you decided that this Jesus thing was real? Was it right after that uh, that you felt so close and connected with God? Or was it during a, during a good time in life or maybe it was during a bad time in life? <clears throat> maybe it was in a time when life was just crummy and you didn't really want to be living it. God is always coming after you. He is pursuing you. You don't have to wait for a moment in your life where God feels more real to you. He is here. He's in this room and he lives in the hearts of the people who proclaim Jesus as Lord. He's in this room right now, ready to meet with you. You don't have to wait to find him. You don't have to wait to look for him. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, that's all great, Daniel, but you just don't know what I've been through. You don't know my life or what is plaguing me right 
Now, maybe you think that you're too far off and that God couldn't save you. Maybe you think you're too far off to come to the foot of the cross. Maybe you think you're too far off. You've sinned too much. Let me remind you of the apostle Paul. Paul states that he is the chief of sinners and that he was saved so that people like you and I could be saved, could know that your sin is not bigger than the cross of Christ. Let that sink in. Your sin is not bigger than the cross of Christ. That's good news. That is good news. Maybe you're here today and you simply don't see the need for Jesus in your life. You've got it going on. You've been getting the promotions. Your family's going great. You keep thinking to yourself message after message after message that you have this thing under control and you only want to bother God when things are out of your control. Listen to this. God opposes the proud. Isn't that terrifying? He's literally in opposition to the proud. People who think they have everything under control. He opposes you. He is against you. He's against me when I feel like I've got it under control. It's consistent throughout scripture. Uh, Psalm 138, for, the Lord, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Proverbs 3, towards the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Proverbs 29, 29, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Matthew 23, whoever exalts in him will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 1, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. James 4, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. The good news is that God is still pursuing you, but he might have to wound you to get your attention. He might have to hit you over the head with a two by four to get your attention. He's done it many times throughout the scriptures. But that doesn't have to be your story this morning. Perhaps you will train wreck your marriage. Perhaps you will run off one of your children Perhaps you'll accumulate so much debt that you see no way out of it. Or perhaps you will just live isolated away from those who love you. But that doesn't have to be your story this morning. Our story can be one of faith, trust, and hope. You don't have to wait for the Lord to pursue you like this. He's already pursuing you. By the simple fact that you're here this morning, it is evidence that he is pursuing you. Slow down, turn around. He's there. You don't have to go searching for God. He isn't lost. Christian, stop saying that you found God. He wasn't lost. You were, and he found you. He loves you. He desires to be in a relationship with his children. He came to this earth to live a perfect and holy life. He came to this earth to die for your sins. He came to save you. He came so that you didn't have to be in control, but that you could rest knowing that he is. Maybe you're here today and Christ has been real to you for 40 plus years, but looking at the world around you, you start to wonder and get impatient. But remember, God is here to encourage you, to renew your strength. God wants you to dig into him and have your strength renewed by the 
body of believers as we come together and rely on one another because we will all fall short. We will all make mistakes. And yet we are here to be with one another through those mistakes so that on the other side, we come out renewed and whole again. Our mistakes don't define us how we as a body of believers come together and go through that with the person that has fallen is what defines us. <clears throat> maybe you're in a really good place this morning. Maybe, maybe you have it going on and life is going well. You pray to God for all the decisions that you need to make. You run everything through his filter and everything about your life is just on cloud nine. You are hitting all cylinders and praise God that you're in that place. But let me remind you that that joy and that is, and that wonder that you are going through is not to be kept to yourself. Share it with others. Don't be afraid to talk about what God is doing in your life. Don't be afraid to share what the Lord is doing in your life with the others because that might just be what they need to be on that same plateau with you. They might need to hear that things have been good and that God is good and that on the other side of this mess that I'm in, that God is there waiting and he's good and he's ready to be with us all the time. For me, the bottom line of today, of what I really feel like the Lord wants me to share is, is this one line. <clears throat> For all you that are control freaks, everybody that wants to be in control, everybody that has the desire to control your life, to be in charge of everything about your life, Jesus came so that you didn't have to be in control. He came so that you could rest knowing that he is in control. He came knowing, he came so that you could know that he is in control and you don't have to be. Let's pray.